It was the Patricia Moore case, uh, which got me uh, a lot of notoriety with respect to my involvement in Compton. It has been something that people were setting people up in Compton, from what I could see. I was very shocked that the United States government had entered into that community and spent so many, so many years uh, with such intensity trying to corrupt public officials. And I know from their point of view it was a sting operation. It was designed to see if public officials would accept bribes. And they don't see themselves as corrupting people, but I thought they went really overboard in that case, and I was quite offended by it. They were harassing us. Well, our phones were being tapped. They were following us. Uh, they were sending uh, various informants into our lives, uh, women. There were over 600 surveillance tapes, video and audio, that were part of the Compton investigation that I was involved in. And I listened to all of them. I also had FBI prepared transcripts of those tapes. Many lawyers would have just looked at the transcripts because to listen to these tapes is very tedious. There are gaps and, and periods where there's confusion in the tapes. But I decided to listen to the tapes. And one Saturday night I was in my office, and I won't forget that, I put another audio tape into my machine, and it didn't sound like any other audio tape I had heard. I was invited to a dinner, and uh, Omar Bradley and I were invited to a dinner. And we went to the dinner, and when we went to the dinner, uh, they had uh, some people there, and my own cousin, Reverend Fisher, it was supposed to be a dinner for him. So we went to the dinner to celebrate with him. And they had people in there. Uh, they had a white businessman and another white man I didn't even know. And uh, I didn't know him until I went to the grand jury and I saw that he was an FBI man. I don't, don't know why the man was there, but uh, they were offering, they wanted to give uh, Omar and myself envelopes. They said they had some information to give to us. And you heard clanking in the background, and I heard various voices that were familiar to me because you had two FBI agents and a FBI informant who were talking about Notre Dame football and other things. And at one point, one of them said uh, words to the effect, they're greedy, every black one's coming from everywhere, we'll put Tucker and Moore on ice and get another one. And I told Omar, I looked and the Lord always have led me. So I wondered why they want to give us an envelope with uh, some information in it. If it was information that they wanted, I figured that they should have brought it to City Hall. So I told Omar when they went to give him the envelope, I said, Omar, keep your hands on the table. There also were some other tapes that were disturbing, particularly involving the investigation into Omar Bradley. Uh, I saw repeated efforts by various agents and informants to try and corrupt Omar Bradley. Knowing this government like we know him, J. Edgar Hoover and those who come after him, J. Edgar Hoover gave birth to a mindset that's prevalent in the counterintelligence program today, FBI, you name it. They have always been on the look of the rise of a black messiah type. They have watched our people and they're always looking to see, well, are there any black people out there with the gumptions to go against anything that we believe in? And I knew, as Minister Farrakhan and others knew, and it wasn't just his stance with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan that this government uh, felt that they had to come against. No. They had to come against Mayor Omar Bradley because the, the mindset of white supremacy cannot stand to see a stand-up black man. And to see a stand-up black man like Mayor Omar Bradley, that means he then will give birth to a new black idea that destroys his white idea. From the day the mayor was elected until the day we had to go to court, every day, there was always something going on. Uh, we had some incidents that happened between the Compton Police Department. There was a lot of murders in the community. And part of what the mayor's administration was, we was trying to turn that around and turn Compton into one of the model cities 
Uh, but we just had so much opposition. Every day we had some opposition. There was always some accusations. There was always people coming after us, so to speak, uh, at federal, undercover interventions, community informants, and the like. So it was never a peaceful moment while we were in the mayor's uh, during the mayor's tenure. And when they were not successful, they just kept trying. I remember clear as day, one uh, agent who was posing as a, as a waste to energy plant developer, sitting down with Omar Bradley and telling him, we'll pay you a commission, we'll pay you a referral fee, we'll pay you a consulting fee, we'll give you cash. And he kept saying, no, no, no. And I distinctly remember uh, him having a shirt that said African American on the shirt and the, t and the tape, the FBI video surveillance tape zeroes in on those words African American on his sweatshirt and then zooms back. But he kept t saying I'm a teacher and I'm only interested in the community, I'm not here to make money. They were harassing us, well, our phones were being tapped, they were following us, uh, they were sending uh, various informants into our lives. When that didn't work, they had other people approach him, uh, saying essentially the same thing in other words. And of course, when that didn't work, they kept trying to call Omar Bradley on the phone. And I heard all those audio tapes where they'd keep trying to reach him. I even heard one audio tape where one undercover informant was trying to suggest that they could set him up with a white blonde woman in a hotel. And this is about, as I recall, about four years into the investigation where they appear very frustrated because they can't seem to get him to do something illegal. And anybody who did not bow under that pressure of white supremacy then became an enemy of the state. I knew one, one time in particular I was doing a show out there and I used to do rodeos and I did a rodeo and one of the policemen had bought two federal undercover agents to my rodeo acting as vendors. And one of the times they lent me some money to produce a show. And when I went to pay them back, first question they asked me, did you give the mayor any of this money? And then my antennas went up and I knew right then that we were part of a, a bigger problem. I remember another videotape where they're interviewing an African-American man and the, the informant for the government uh, asks him if he's on welfare. He says no. And they ask him if he'll just drop an envelope of cash on various politicians' desks at the Compton City Council. And as I recall, he tried to do that with various officials. But clearly there was tremendous frustration in their inability to get Omar Bradley to take a payoff. And I could see it in all these tapes, and they went on for four years. Well, of course, Mayor Tucker was an African-American mayor of Compton. Uh, Patricia Moore was an African-American city councilwoman. And I found the comments offensive. I did uh, address the issue in open court. We filed a motion to dismiss the indictment for selective prosecution based on race. The tape was played in open court. Uh, the motion was denied. However, when I looked at the FBI transcript, I didn't see those words in the transcript. So I pointed that out as well. We ran against uh, Marcin Shaw. And I remember saying to my husband, I said, if Miss Shaw wins, I'm going to give her a big hug and I'm not going to gripe. I'm just going to tell her a job well done. But much to my surprise, Miss Shaw didn't win that evening. In April, I poll watched for the election of 2001, the uh, primary. And my sister and I sat there all day. And at the end of the uh, counting, we noticed and we looked at each other because we were very, uh, very alert. We were accurate with the numbers that we saw come in and vote. And we were told that we were 90 votes short of the actual number of people that came in. Now, I can see maybe five, but 90 was impossible. So I knew then that something was wrong with the election that something was going to happen in the election. And I wish that that time that I could have talked to him more about it because he was so preoccupied that he didn't understand that these people are going to cheat. They've already started. We were entering into a runoff with someone else. That primary election resulted in Eric Perrin being the candidate 
which ran against Omar. There was so much wrong with the election. I was absolutely incensed. When I looked at some of the documentation and some of the atrocities that took place in this case, I was appalled. Our research showed that dead people were voting. We had situations where ballot boxes were stuffed. We found that non-citizens voted in large numbers. Uh, we had situations where people that weren't we even alive were voting. Um, there were also a number of people who weren't registered citizens of the United States that voted in the election. Something was fishy in the state of Denmark and the smell was starting right then. We found evidence that people from the opposition, the new mayor had guns, they swore they had permits for these guns. On election day we were at Caldwell Elementary and uh, at that time, we were out passing out literatures to voters, asking for support for our candidates. And at that time, we were uh, confronted by about 12 individuals. Uh, they got out of the car uh, yelling. They were threatening. Uh, a couple of them even uh, brandished weapons, uh, raising up their shirt, showing me weapons, uh, threatening. And the uh, current mayor, uh, Eric Paradin, was with them. and. Uh, he threatened me himself. He told me that there would be severe repercussions for supporting his opposition. And he told me that uh, he wouldn't stop until he see myself and my family in the street. Those were some of the legalities. The amount of things that were wrong were incredible. One of the side points of the trial was that Leslie Irving testified that she had registered people to vote. And it was subsequently proven that she had illegally registered and voted for illegal aliens by means of deception. Uh, when the judge found out that she had done this and had perjured herself on the witness stand, she declared that Leslie Irving would never be allowed to run for political office in the state of California again. What's interesting about this is because this is the same person that the state administrator had appointed to the school board seat and that I tried to block and was subsequently arrested for. Now, this is the type of person that he wanted to sit on his school board. Someone who was deceptive, who was a liar, and was thrown off the school board even after she was elected to it once again. I joined forces with Omar and Frank Witten to sue because we are the descendants of Martin Luther King. People I know died for the idea of one man, one vote, for African Americans to vote, and for that kind of nonsense to happen in Compton was just wrong. I was always afraid that somebody would harm Omar physically because of the enemies that he made within the city and outside of the city. His crime was that he stood up, and he said what he thought, and that he was fearless. And for a black man to be fearless is a very dangerous position to be in. The movement to, um, to uh, displace a 100-year police department, I think we did not realize that they were paramilitary and that uh, you know, people argue, well, why didn't you have an election? And why didn't you have um, uh, a, um, an opportunity for the people to decide that? Well, because people didn't know the inside issues with regards to the, uh, what we found through investigation and even confirmed once the sheriff took over through the selling of guns, drugs, the relationship they had with uh, rap groups and death row records and uh, that comes out in videos and, uh, and, and documentaries by individuals uh, that were a part of it. Uh, that uh, it was, it was, and the cost that it was costing with the lack of service. We were in, it was a health issue to get rid of the Compton Police Department. Every city around us had to share. Paramount, in the east, Willowbrook on the uh, north, Carson on the um, south, Athens on the uh, 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 west, and to network and get more police officers and to try to stop the crime 
and 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 along with that, uh, build youth programs uh, and save close to fifteen million dollars and put it into youth programs and employment. We I, I bought into it, and that's why I supported it. And we had forums, and we let people and the. The recent vote by the city of Compton uh, 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 showed when they tried to bring the Compton PD back that it was the right move. In June, and counted the ballots and said and counted the ballots, it was shocking to find that Eric Peredin had won that election. Nobody knew who Eric Peredin was. They didn't even know how to say his name. He had not sent out a large amount of information on himself. Um, he did not have any billboards up. It was people at my school who lived in Compton said, Eric who? They told me stories of not being able to find their polling place, of their polling places being moved. And this is before the national election. This was a prelude to the national election. Cheating was happening in June before it happened in the next national election. And it was the same type of cheating. Um, so when Omar lost that election, it was unbelievable. We had the formula and we developed uh, a formula that was working until um, the uh, counterintelligence programs uh, used on a local level by the district attorneys and uh, the uh, backlash after we had voted to get rid of the Compton PD, they continued to, um, uh, to marshal the FBI and the various governmental agencies, every uh, agency uh, within the federal government, mostly investigatory agencies, from the um, United States Post Office uh, uh, to uh, the um, uh, FBI, to the, the other aspects of the Department of Justice, as well as the Los Angeles County District Attorney, uh, multi task force began to say, we got to, re uh, in, in conjunction with their relationship with Compton Police, because we found in our study that a lot of these agencies were part of the drug dealing and the um, assassination of gang members and, and, and things of this nature. And you say, well, that's a wild statement. Many of the drugs that uh, were, were, were supposed to be confiscated, even the drugs that were found in the locker, were supposed to have been a part of a joint FBI. My, what is my point? My point, those agencies, in conjunction with Compton, former Compton police officers, along with the district attorney office, set off an investigation. The investigations began even prior to 1999, but they stepped up with my election. From that point, they went into a standpoint of character assassination, using their abilities to get their friends in the press to character assassinate Mayor Bradley and any city council people that they deemed supportive of his vision for the city of Compton. When Omar Bradley and uh, Walter Tucker uh, Jr. first took office, many of the residents, such as myself, who were young African Americans that didn't really fit the gang stereotype, were looking at these two men uh, come into power and had the ideas of their own too. Um, we were kind of concerned, but we wanted to follow the same path. But what took a turn for a lot of young men is the problems that uh, Omar Bradley and, and then uh, Walter Tucker Jr. faced. I remember um, when he decided to run for city council, he, uh, he stepped out and people were uh, rather taken back, shocked. People called him arrogant, so-and-so. They called him the Compton mayor, gangster mayor, or whatever, because he was a very uh, big man. He wasn't a small man, big man. And he, uh, after he was on the council, he ran for mayor. But Omar Bradley, what he did was, he walked tall, and he walked hard, and he was outspoken. 
and um, that was intimidating to some people because they did not expect an African-American male to come on as strong as he did. When I first came into Omar Bradley's present, I'm thinking he's a revolutionary. Somebody, a minister Samad had to say, that's Omar Bradley. I said, that's a politician? This brother who's giving orders, the brother who's respecting black people? I said, that's a politician? I had never met a politician who had love for his people but was in a public office. So my impression of Mayor Omar Bradley, a man who demanded that black people not get it all, but get their fair share. That man gave me another look at politicians and the minister said, brother, you don't have another politician. You don't find many like Mayor Omar Bradley. Many black people like myself who were uh, coming up through college, who were born and raised in Compton, living in Compton, was looking to see what our leadership would do about this. He took individuals that, that so on, that, that quote unquote was uh, damaging the city uh, with drug activity, with gang activity, and they, he, those same individuals beautified the city and they were productive in the city. He would reach out to the gangsters on the street because he realized that they needed a new direction. He'd reach out to those who were felons who had no opportunity